uh, Deborah Gross. I would like to introduce Deborah Gross, who is president and CEO of Pennsylvania's for Modern Courts. She will be moderating this evening's event and will introduce the panelists. Please welcome Deborah Gross. So thank you so very much for having us. First, I want to say to the League of Women Voters, you're one of the best partners we ever have. So I want to continue working with you guys all the time. It's just you come up with ideas, you implement, and we get a lot of attendees. So I can't thank you enough for for all your hard work and 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 your support of democracy. Um, okay, so I'm Debbie Gross. I'm the CEO of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. We are an ex organization that was founded 35 years ago to support merit selection. We don't have merit selection in Pennsylvania. We still elect our judges, but people don't know about the importance of the courts, what they do, how judges are public servants, how hard they work, you know, what types of cases they take. So. Um, we have we have now embarked on a campaign, I'll say, to educate the, our our residents, our voters, our you know Pennsylvanians about the courts. We talk about threats to the independence of the judiciary. This is a really important program about magisterial district courts. As Michelle said, magisterial district courts are courts where, as as you'll see, most that that they're most they're the first entry into the legal system for most people. So, and most people enter on their own without an attorney. So we wanna help, I guess, level the playing field and educate people as to how and why, how these courts operate, why they're so important. So I can't thank you enough. I'm gonna pass this over to Leah Simpson, who is our Pittsburgh part-time coordinator. She's gonna take the lead on this, but I truly appreciate everybody's support and all of your being here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Leah. Um, and like Debbie said, I'm the Pittsburgh Program Coordinator for Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. Um, and we want to thank you all for joining tonight's program. Um, and I guess I'll just jump right in to introduce today's panel. We have Judge Kevin E. Cooper, Jr., Judge Thomas G. Miller, Jr., and Judge Nicholas Martini. It is such an honor and a pleasure to have them join us here tonight. Um, and I'd like them to take some time to introduce themselves. And thank you all again for being here. I'll start off. Uh, I'm Judge Tom Miller. I've been a magisterial district judge for 27 years now. Uh, I'm in the Mon Valley area of Allegheny County. Uh, <clears throat> Prior uh, to being a magisterial district judge, I was a police officer in a suburban police department. Uh, one, I'd like to thank the uh, League of Women Voters and also the Pens uh, uh, Pennsylvania for Modern Courts on putting this program on. I believe that the election of our judges is probably one of the most important things uh, that we can do to elect it. Some things that happen, you know, in the court system can have a great effect on everybody. And that's why it is important to know who's running for the judicial offices and uh, you know, to be, become educated in that. Um, my experience as magisterial district judge, as I said, was I've been on the bench for 27 years. Uh, I've been both president of our Allegheny County District Judges Association and also our state District Judges Association. I priorly served uh, by appointment of the Supreme Court on the Minor Court Rules Committee and currently serve on the Minor Judiciary Education Board with Deb. All right, my name is uh, Judge Kevin Cooper Jr. I am the magistrate in Homewood, East Hills, Lincoln Larmer, and a portion of East Liberty. Uh, I have been in office for seven years. Uh, my father was a magistrate district judge as well. He was in office for 24 years before I took his spot. Um, prior to being an MDJ, I was a school teacher, elementary school teacher. Um, taught all grades in elementary school, but mostly uh, fifth grade math. Um, enjoyed that. Um, and then the kids kind of wore me out. I've always been an inner city, got a master's degree in elementary education, love, you know, being in the community. And uh, it was, you know, I had an opportunity to, to switch my career and I wanted to do it sooner than later. Um, so I did that in my early 30s. Um, it was the best move I could make have a lot more time to be in the community and, and just help 
help help the people out. You know, um, I really enjoy being a magistrate and, and uh, you know, what we stand for as magistrates as well. And I look forward to answering your questions today and give me a little bit more insight of what a MDJ does. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Judge Nick Martini. I represent two wards in the city of Pittsburgh, which encompasses the entire west end of the city of Pittsburgh. There's about 16 neighborhoods that is, are in my jurisdiction. In addition to that, uh, as a city district judge, Judge Cooper and I also work at Pittsburgh Municipal Court, which is a central court that handles all criminal traffic matters and non-traffic matters that the Pittsburgh police are involved in as well as the arraignment court, which is a 24 seven operation, also is housed at Pittsburgh Municipal Court. Um, like Judge Cooper as well, my father was the district judge in the district that I now represent for 16 and a half years before he retired. Prior to me assuming office in January of 2022, so I've been on the bench almost two years now, I was a school teacher just like Judge Cooper for Pittsburgh Public Schools. I'm a middle school um, high school social studies teacher. I worked primarily at Pittsburgh Brashear and Perry High Schools. Um, also, after that, I worked for the city of Pittsburgh for almost eight years, first with Mayor Ravenstall's office, and then I worked in the Office of Management and Budget, leaving as a program supervisor for federal CDBG community block grants. And prior to being elected district judge for the district that I now represent, I was a municipal manager for three years. It's managing all the employees in the municipality as well as the budget and financial affairs. So thank you so much, um, League of Women Voters and Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts for asking me to be on the panel this evening. Also, I'll also add, um, I am, I've been appointed by um, our district director, Judge Miller, to serve on two state committees for our state committee association. I'm on the public relations committee and I'm also one of the two Allegheny County legislative liaisons for that committee as well. Thank you all for that very much. Um, I'd like to start then with Judge Miller and asking a little bit about the history of magisterial district courts. Okay, thank you. I'm a number of people and I don't know the age group of the people that are watching this, but uh, if some of the more senior members might remember the old justice of the peace system that was in Pennsylvania uh, back in the 60s and prior to that. And under that, the justice of the peace uh, was kind of like the judge for the area. The problem is he received no salary. He was paid on the, the fines that he collected. So there was really no incentive for somebody to be find, found not guilty. If you find somebody not guilty, you didn't make any money. In 1968, uh, the state of Pennsylvania had a constitutional convention where they totally revised the court system into what is known as the unified judicial system. And that started the magisterial district courts as we know them now. Uh, the constitutional convention started in, it was in 1968. They had elections in uh, the following year in 1969. And uh, <clears throat> the magisterial district judges started in 1970. Uh, you know, the term magistrate is used a lot uh, because it was a magisterial district uh, that the judges were elected in. The original term uh, from the Constitutional Convention was district justice. Uh, that uh, went until 2004 when the Supreme Court changed the name to Magisterial District Judge. And now everybody is referred to as district judges. However, the old term magistrate still kind of holds on. But it's a unified system. Uh, a lot of people call it the community courts because the judges are elected from the communities uh, where they serve. They have to be a resident for so long uh, <clears throat> prior to running for election. Uh, a lot of times they are known in the community because they've been involved in things and they know their community. They know, you know basically who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, and uh, you know, what is happening in their areas. Thank you. And can I ask why is why are they referred to as the People's Court? The People's Court because they're elected by the people in the area 
um, where they are elected. They are there to represent the people in that area. Um, you know, uh, Judge Cooper, you know, said where he was from, Judge Cooper lives in that area. Judge Martini lives in the area where he is elected. I am, you know, a resident of the area, you know, and you have to be there. You have to be there to re represent the people. It's the people's court of the community court. You know your community and the people where you are elected. Thank you, Judge Miller. Um, the next question that we have is what types of cases do you see? And I'll direct that towards Judge Kevin Cooper, Jr. In my particular courtroom, um, I mostly hear uh, landlord tenant cases. Um, and this is in Homewood, East Hills and Lincoln Larmer. Um, I also hear truancy cases. And, and within the past two years, um, I've been hearing a lot of non-traffic permits, licenses, and inspections. So that deals with diff different residential and commercial uh, real estate throughout my area. So that is the bulk. It keeps me extremely busy. Uh, I'm hearing those, those three particular areas. Um, but when I'm in Pittsburgh Municipal Court during the preliminary hearings, I mean, I'm in domestic violence court. I'm in child's court. Um, I'm in criminal court, I might be in housing court, um, and then I might be in arraignment court as well. And I'm probably, and then and I hear preliminary hearings for homicide hearings as well. So, so um, my, my plate is pretty full. Um, so it's, it's a well-rounded variety of different uh, cases that I hear on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Judge Cooper. Um, well, and can, then I, can I add into that a little bit? Of course you okay. can. Sure. Okay. Uh, we have jurisdiction in a wide variety of cases. Uh, yeah, Judge Cooper said, um, yeah, in his own courtroom where he does a lot of uh, landlord tenant issues, we handle landlord tenant issues. We have handled civil cases uh, to a $12,000 jurisdictional max. Uh, so it's like a small claims type court. Um, we serve in arraignment court. Uh, arraignment court in Allegheny County is a 24-7 uh, operation. There is a judge down in the arraignment court, you know, every hour of the day, 365 days a year. We handle traffic hearings. We handle non-traffic hearings where somebody is charged with uh, summary violations. We handle um, you know, pre preliminary arraignments, which is the first uh, step in the court system that people are there. Judge Cooper mentioned preliminary hearings. Um, we also handle protection from abuse orders, emergency protection from abuse orders. We handle uh, arrest warrants, search warrants um, that the, the police are requesting. Um, and yeah, pr probably one of the best parts, you know, is we can also preside over marriages. And then Judge Martini, are you noticing the same types of things in your courtroom? Yes, uh, 100%. We do it like as my jurisdiction is in the city of Pittsburgh, as Judge Cooper's is, my court is very heavy in landlord tenant matters. I've done over, I've done probably over 650 landlord tenant cases in not even two years. A lot of that is definitely attributed to the post COVID and, you know, during pandemic spikes for sure. Um, I handle a lot of civil matters. As Judge Miller said, the maximum limit is $12,000. And I also do building code non traffic. Um, summary offense hearings, which I did this today. Actually, I had 25 today on the docket as well as truancies. And then the municipal court, we handle the criminal matters, arraignment, traffic, and Judge Cooper, you know, hom prelim homicide. So, yep, same, same cases. And I also, I do preside over marriages as well. I, I married a couple last week. So that's a, one nice thing we definitely get to do. And then Judge Martini, the people in your courtroom, do you notice them representing themselves or do they have a lawyer? Um, more often than not, most are pro se, meaning they represent themselves. On occasion, we will I will have um, either a defendant or plaintiff that does have an attorney. It's not as often, which is why, as kind of Judge Miller alluded to earlier, this is really the people's court where a lot of these um, matters, not, not talking about criminal cases, obviously, but when you're talking about landlord-tenant cases, civil cases, summary cases, the bulk of the litigants are, are pro se, meaning they're not represented by an attorney. So that, that is definitely another um, way that this court is called the people's court because it was kind of designed to, you know, you didn't necessarily have to be a lawyer to present your case, your civil matter, 
before the judge who is who lives in one of the neighborhoods in the district. So, but I would say probably 85% of the cases I hear in my office, there are no attorneys. And Judge Miller, do you? Um, oh, go ahead, Judge Cooper. Yeah, I wanted to chime in on that. So just recently, this would probably be within the last maybe year and a half. Um, I have a program in my courtroom called the Lawyer of the Day program. And pretty much, and it's just for landlord tenant cases. So if a tenant comes in and they want free representation from an attorney that oversees a uh, landlord tenant, specializes in landlord tenant, they will represent them. And it's been a uh, tremendous resource that I use in, in courtroom because not only is the, the tenant getting educated of the process because a lot of those, those these agreements are wordy. They can be very tricky sometimes. You know, you just want to get a place to stay. So you just sign off on a lease without really knowing what's in the lease. And this Lawyer Today program, the lawyers are really able to kind of break down these leases. And then it helps the landlords out, too, you know, because the the the, the lawyer also has other additional resources that may help with financial assistance. Um, they need some one, you know, to, to do um, just and that helps out as well. So um, I'm hoping the, the grant continues. I know it's a yearly thing, but it's 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 been a tremendous resource that I've been pushing for for years. But it's just came into my courtroom, and I would say probably ninety percent of the time, out of my landlord tenant cases, both the landlord and the tenant go away happy, and they feel that they got educated and they better understand the process as well. Because some people inherit these homes and inherit properties and parents think, you know, just because they were into real estate, when they pass along that the, their children are interested, but they never taught the children the process. So this is another way where they can learn the process and be better abreast as uh, landlords. Thank you. Okay. In my courtroom, all, in my criminal cases, almost everyone is represented by an attorney, uh, either a private attorney or a lot are represented by the public defender's office. And then the Commonwealth is represented by the district attorney's office. Uh, as uh, Judge Martini said, uh, our civil cases, uh, occasionally I'll have attorneys that will be representing uh, either one or both sides. And uh, but for my landlord tenant cases, they are almost all pro se for both sides. The landlord is not represented and the tenant is not represented. Thank you, Judge Miller. Um, then I'm wondering for people that don't have the benefit of having a lawyer, are there extra steps that you take to explain the legal processes and laws to those in your courtroom? Yeah, you have to take steps, but you have to be careful because you really can't give legal advice to people. We are prohibited from doing that. And you want to make sure that you don't step over the line as far as having ex parte communications. Uh, if people come in and they are unsure what they're doing, we always ask them, are you sure you don't want to obtain an attorney on this? Um, and if they're unsure, uh, on a criminal case, we give them information for getting the public defender. Um, if it's a civil or landlord tenant case, we provide them information on uh, contacting the Laurel Re Lawyer Referral Service that the Bar Association runs uh, as far as you know, maybe talking to somebody. And if they want to obtain an attorney, we will grant them a brief continuance on the case. But you, you know, a lot of times we tell people, you know, hey, if you're representing yourself, you are still bound by the rules of court. And even though we're a community court and are probably, you know, a little less uh, stringent on the rules as the Court of Common Pleas might be, there are still rules that they have to abide by. They are our rules. And where it gets hard is when one party is represented by an attorney and the other one is not. And they're not real sure what to do when they come in. Uh, you know, yeah, that's the hard part sometimes. Okay, great. Um, and then I'm wondering, uh, maybe Judge Martini, you can answer this first. 
are you able to control or have flexibility in setting your courtroom hours? Yes, we are. Um, we we have to, you know, we have the duty to hear cases in a, you know, expedite, expedited, you know, schedule. So landlord tenant cases must be heard seven to 15 days upon filing. Civil cases must be heard 45 to 60 days upon filing. And then criminal matters, obviously, you know, usually are scheduled for the first preliminary hearing two to three weeks upon filing date or arraignment date. But we do, Judge Cooper and I also, as I, we mentioned before, um, our task with staffing Pittsburgh Municipal Court. So we have assigned shifts and days there. So obviously we can't do anything in our courts those days and times because we're at Pittsburgh Municipal Court. But the other um, days that we are not assigned there, we do have flexibility in when we schedule things. But I typically, and I'm sure Judge Cooper and Miller do the same thing. We, I mean, I schedule things the same days of the week. I have civils a day, Tuesdays, I have landlord tenants, Wednesdays, and I have building code things Thursdays. And then I, and then when I, my truancy really picks up, I also do those Wednesdays as well. So, but you know, when last week, for example, I was at continuing education, which is probably a question we're going to get into later about just, you know, what we're required with continuing ed. But so I was in Harrisburg um, four days last week for the mandatory continuing education. So obviously um, Tuesday through Friday last week, I had no hearings because I was not in town, but so we, you know, things just get, this week became much busier for me because that's pretty much where all those cases went. They got put into this week. So. Great. So I guess we can continue on with um, education training and Judge Cooper, did you have to attend that same education training last week or what um, kind of training do you have to go through? So every it's mandatory every year, every magistrate has to do a 40 hours of continuing ed education. Um, so we all have to go to Harrisburg um, and we get abreast, we get updated on all the new laws. You figure law change constantly. So that's why it's so important for us to go to Harrisburg and participate in this. Class. Um, so yeah, we don't, we get the, so Judge Miller, since he's been in office, of course, a lot more than uh, Judge Martini and I, he has, you know, first dibs on what week he wants to go up. So once, you know, Judge Miller and other senior judges pick their dates, then it kind of filters down and we get to choose what week. Um, but we have to make sure that we get our continuing education done um, in the course of a year. They usually um, ask us at the beginning of the year and then they fill up all the weeks. Um, the only time, and Judge Miller can correct me or Martini can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they do it between June and uh, June, July, August. They don't do anything. They pick right back up in September, if I'm not mistaken. But yes, we do the continuing ed um, every year. Yeah. yeah, our education year runs from September to May. So there are uh, okay. about 16 weeks scheduled in that time uh, for everybody throughout the Commonwealth. And each week, each county or each judicial district has so many spots that they can fill in with it. And the classes are held at the uh, Pennsylvania Judicial Center, uh, which is in downtown Harrisburg. So Judge Miller, what is the certification process in order to become an MDJ? Okay. <clears throat> Two things can happen. One, if you are an attorney, you're a member of the bar, uh, there is, you, you do not have to pass any type of certification. If you are a lay judge uh, that you have not been to law school, you have to uh, take a month long class. It's a very intensive class for a month. It's held out in Harrisburg. It's offered uh, twice a year, I believe. And then you must pass an extensive test. In addition to that, if you are elected, there is an additional week, which we refer to as new judge school, uh, that you have to attend also. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then I'm wondering, can you have another job um, and be an MDJ or run a business or anything like that? Well, I, under, uh, 
under the Constitution, there is nothing uh, that prohibits you from doing that. However, the rules say that the court business of the court has to be your primary duty. Uh, so I know there are some attorneys that you know, still have a small practice and they are limited uh, by the rules on what they can do. They can't ap appear before another magisterial district judge. They can't appear in criminal court in the county which they serve. Uh, but I know for the most part, a lot of people now are full-time judges. I'm, I'm a full-time judge. I'm in my office five days a week. Uh, you know, but there, there is nothing that prohibits you right now, but just the workload, um, especially in some of the busier courts, you know, I don't know how you would do another job unless you did it, you know, in the evenings or, um, you know, on your personal time. Just to uh, add to that, um, Judge Miller is co uh, completely accurate with that. I do know some MDJs that are lawyers that sometimes will practice outside of the area that they're at. So, you know, if we have someone in Allegheny County, but they're an attorney, they can have a case in Harrisburg or Philadelphia or York, you know, um, so, so, but it does, but like Judge Miller said, it cannot interfere with the business as an MDJ. And they figure their schedules out. The ones that I know, they do a lot of their work on the weekend and they'll adjust their schedule enough to be able to hear a hearing, you know, during a week where it doesn't affect their work at their MDJ office. But I don't know a lot to do, but I just wanted to share that there are a few um, judges that are attorneys that do that. Thank you for that. Um, and then we have a question uh, going back to continuing education. Um, someone's wondering what topics are covered in continuing education and who decides what is presented. Uh there's a, a board that's appointed, appointed by the Supreme Court, the Minor Judiciary Education Board. They're the ones that decide what is taught. Certain things we have to have by statute. I mean, there's always a criminal law update. There's always a civil law update. Uh, there's uh, any updates on traffic laws. Uh, we had um, we have classes on domestic violence. We have classes on um, you know, uh, how to handle, you know, maybe somebody that has mental health issues. Um, you know, we have classes on, um, you know, court security, okay, things that happen in the court uh, and how to make sure your staff, the people in your courtroom and yourself are protected. Thank you for that, Judge Miller. Yeah. Um, Leah, there, I was as I was just at continuing ed last week. So there was a couple items too that are usually discussed as well. One being like leadership, you know, trying to be a, an effective leader within your community, but also on the bench. And also, and then additionally too, they um, uh, what was the other thing I want? Um, courtroom security. Judge Miller said, but um, they talk also about you know your office reports and things that that are generated from your office ways to kind of catch if there's any fraudulent activity going on in your office because you know one thing a lot of people don't realize is our offices take a lot of money in you know from traffic payments non -tra non traffic fines etc and all of this needs to be accounted for to the penny every day so they go over a lot of different ways that we can try to flush out any fraudulent activity that could be going on unfortunately with our staff because this has happened in district courts where, you know, staff have figured out ways to manipulate things and take money. So that's something that they definitely stress on quite a bit about ways for us to, you know, ensure that our staff are not doing this. So that's an important yeah. topic too. This, this year also, uh, one of the topics is how to deal with people with autism. Mm -hmm. uh, we had somebody come in from the autism society that uh, pr did an excellent presentation uh, because, you know, Sometimes the people, people come in that are autistic, they are scared and uh, just different ways to deal with them. But uh, Nick mentioned about the uh, amount of money that is brought into the system. Now this uh, is a couple years old, but uh, a few years ago, $180 million was dispersed to the state, 44 million dispersed to the counties, 34 million to local municipalities, 4 million dispersed to victims in restitution, and uh, 
then there was $870,000 that was given in credit for community service where people did not have the ability to pay in a fine or cost. So judges assigned them community service. Uh, yeah, instead of uh, having to cough up the cash. And then can MDJs request topics to go over for continuing education? Yes, every year um, after each class, uh, electronically, there is uh, a form to rate the instructor, rate the presentation. Do you think it was the time was enough? Do you need more time, less time? And any ideas that you have uh, for future classes. Excellent. Um, so you mentioned uh, that in the last continuing education, you brushed up on how to deal with people with disabilities. So what do you do if English is a second language or a party has a disability or a handicap limiting their understanding of the proceeding? Okay, there um, in Allegheny County, um, we have interpreters uh, that we have access to. Uh, there's forms we have to fill out there is, um, you know, you fill it out, you put the language in that is required, and uh, then you have an interpreter that is assigned to the court uh, to handle that. Uh, some courts um, are ve very busy with that. Uh, Judge Barton, who is in the Castle Shannon area, I think is the largest user of interpreters in the state of Pennsylvania. Also, if you are downtown for preliminary arraignments, uh, we use a company called Language Line, uh, where you can get a interpreter on the line and through a three-way conversation with the judge, the interpreter, and the defendant, they are, uh, you know, they can understand what you're trying to tell them. Um, so then, Judge Cooper, I'm wondering, what does someone do if they have a complaint about an MDJ? Um, they can file a complaint. I want to say it's through the um, ethics. There's an ethics um, site that you could go to, and you can file that complaint. And then they review it. The ethics board will review it, and they feel well, if it's something needs to, to go to the next level, then um, you have to go to Harrisburg and address that issue. Um, I'm, I'm hoping I'm wording it right, but I know you have to do it through um, the, the ethics committee. Yeah, there, there are two, uh, two uh, courts, or not courts, but uh, two boards set up through the state. One is the Judicial Conduct Board, and the other one is the Court of Judicial Discipline. And the Judicial Conduct Board uh, is where an uh, original complaint would go, that somebody could file a complaint against a member of the judiciary. Uh, the Conduct Board looks at it, they investigate it, and decides, you know, was this actual a violation of the rules? Um, or, you know, was it something that uh, people just have some sour grapes because the judge ruled against them? However, if they find it is serious enough to warrant uh, something, they refer the case to the Court of Judicial Discipline, where uh, <clears throat> the judge is kind of put on trial. And so... Do you all have meetings with the president judge of the Court of Common Pleas or is there just the Judicial Conduct Board or how does that work? Well, we, we have meetings with our, our uh, county association, the executive board. We try and meet quarterly with the president judge. Um, and that's just in Allegheny County. Each different judicial district has their own ways that they handle meetings with the, the president judge. We have been very fortunate in Allegheny County. We, we have always had a good working relationship with our president judges. Uh, sometimes we didn't have the same opinion on things, but uh, you know, we've had a good working relationship with them. Yeah, I, I actually, today I had a one hour um, office visit with our president judge in Allegheny County, Kim Berkeley Clark, came to my courtroom. She wanted to see it, take a tour and just chat with me a little bit. So we did that today for an hour. She said she has a couple courts left, but she has 
In her term as president judge, she will have visited at all 46 district courts in Allegheny County. I don't know if that's ever happened, Judge Miller, with any other president judges. No, Judge uh, Judge Clark has been very good um, as far as communication with us and working with us. And yeah, like you said, she has gone out and visited every court mm -hmm. in the country. County. There are 46 courts in Allegheny County. Uh, and just a, a side note, uh, when I was a police officer, Judge Clark was my assistant district attorney. That's really cool. Um, I have a question for Judge Martini. Uh, do you have forms for pro se litigants, so people that represent themselves, or do you provide the rules to them? For pro se litigants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, we have we have various forms that are available from the administrative office of Pennsylvania courts, um, depending on what kind of case it is. I mean, Judge Miller kind of brushed on this earlier, but if it's if it's a criminal matter downtown, I mean, we certainly I, mean, I certainly explain to the um, litigant, you know, the do you want to get an attorney? You know, you have every right to do so. We're, we're happy to continue this, you know, a few weeks in order for you to either obtain a public defender or private counsel. But. I mean, yeah, so I, my court and at Pittsburgh Municipal Court, we do provide any forms that we have available to us for litigants that may not have an attorney. And if if it's a criminal matter and a litigant wants to go go pro se, they we have a form that's from the Administrative Office of Pennsylvania Courts that they have to waive their right to counsel in order to proceed in a criminal matter. Uh, thank you so much. So Judge Cooper, what is your favorite thing you get to do as a MDJ? I'm a community guy. I mean, I, I really just like staying involved in the, the, the community. Um, so often, you know, they'll ask us to um, like, for example, Pittsburgh for Modern Courts, they have, um, I mean, Pennsylvania for Modern Courts, they have different presentations that we can do for the community. So, you know, I've done a few of those. Um, I've done a lot of landlord-tenant presentations. Um, you know, I've, I always try to be available for the community. I try to keep myself abreast of what's going on in the community. And um, I'm a, just a community person. So I like that aspect of it. Um, I love my colleagues. Uh, I really have some good uh, quality colleagues that I can just kind of bounce ideas off of or, you know, get some resources from them and share some of the resources that I'm using. Uh, um, I also love that you never have to make an immediate decision. You never have to feel pressured as a judge that you have to make the decision right then and there on the spot. And I learned that early. You know, you have colleagues, you have you know, attorneys, you know, you have so many different resources, especially when we go to continue and add, you got telephone numbers for every person that, that that gives a presentation. So there's no reason to ever rush on a judgment if you're not sure. And I really like that aspect of it because that way, you know that you did everything that you possibly could as a judge to make the right decision. And you educated yourself or you, you, you make sure that you're fully rounded in the information that's needed to make sure that you make the right decision. So th those are some of the main things that I enjoy most as an MDJ. Thank you. Judge Miller, what's your favorite part of being an MDJ? Uh, kind of the same thing as uh, Judge Cooper was saying. I love being involved in the community. I have um, a few elementary schools in my area um, <clears throat> where I go frequently and uh, do programs there for them. Uh, I've done things, uh, I have a branch campus at Penn State where I always go over and do a program for the incoming freshmen that come in and uh, you know, tell them, you know, and it's a little different when you're going to college and you're away on your own and sometimes you don't make very good decisions on why it's important to make good decisions on things. But I love being involved in the schools. Uh, some of my principals there have a thing about, they have lunch, with the principal. And if you've done a good thing, you get to have lunch with the principal. Well, sometimes it's lunch with the judge. And it's, you know, the, the uh, students, it's something because they've done something very good or improved their grades. Uh, you know, 
So it, it's kind of fun working with the youth of the community. Also, I do things with the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. Uh, they come into the office. You know, we make them all judges for the day. I have a little certificate that I hand out to them. Um, I have a small robe that I had somebody make up that they get to put on and get their picture taken with. And then we do a mock trial. And it depends on you know, the grade level, but we do you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And Goldilocks, we know how bad she was breaking into a house, eating the porridge. Yeah, she's charged with criminal mischief because she broke the bear's chair. And we go through that and with them and they all have play a part. And then they make a decision on what they have to do. Um, I've also worked in the past with the high school uh, and the FBI uh, where they've done some programs. Uh, and we've had some mock trials and things like that. But that's the best part when you get to get out, especially with the youth. Thank you. That sounds really fun. I wish I could be there for <laughs> Goldilocks mock trial. Um, okay. can, can you wear a blonde wig? We can make you Goldilocks. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Martini, what's your favorite part of being an MDJ? Similarly to what judges Cooper and Miller kind of already said, I mean, I'm, I'm very active in my community as well. As as you know, I've, I've hosted numerous Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts um, workshops just this year. Um, I'm also very active in my local schools as a former teacher with Pittsburgh Public Schools. I've always believed in trying to help our youth and guide them in the right direction. Um, I, I do I do a lot of guest readers. I, I have mostly elementary and middle schools in my district. I don't have a high school anymore, but I do a lot of guest reader days there. Um, one of my big elementary schools had an autism um, acceptance walk in the spring. So they were elated. I was I participated in that with them. They loved it. We got a bunch of pictures taken. Um, and for, oddly enough, so I had a I had a defendant from an old 2009 non-traffic. He was found guilty by my dad in 2009. So he actually, I'm not, no names given here, but he is actually a Hollywood actor today who lived in Pittsburgh back then, was found guilty of some type of non-traffic infraction. He contacts my office last year and is like, Judge, I don't understand what, the, I had no idea what this was. I said, sir, I said, all I can tell you is you were found guilty in 2009 this couple hundred dollar fine exists. He said, well, he's like, I don't agree with it. I said, well, you know, I said, listen, I said, can you do some community service? I said, to wipe this out. And the money wasn't an obvious an issue with him because a couple hundred dollars was nothing. But he said, you know what? I want to do something with the kids. So I set up a thing with my largest school. He flew in, did a presentation at the school. Pittsburgh Public publicized this greatly. The kids loved it. It was four grade levels. I don't know what this cost him to fly in here, stay here, whatever, but I facilitated this whole thing. I had the mayor come. The kids loved it. And I mean, it, it was it was just so nice to see all the smiles on their faces. And he he was he was so happy to do it. And he actually bought them all Chick-fil-A for lunch, additionally. I said, I said, could I get a piece of chicken? I, I didn't get it, you know, but but it but <laughs> I, I, I wanted a sandwich too. But anyway, but it was it was just a great thing, but you know when you can when you can see just you know some when you can do something to help somebody out is is a great deal of what we do. And Act One Sixty Three of Twenty Two with potential fine and fee forgiveness for these old offenses, which I didn't have the ability to do when when I talked to this gentleman. But I mean, you know, you can when you're able to help somebody who's just down on their luck and they're able to maybe get their license back. And I mean, you know, it changes someone's life, and that's that's what I try to do. And obviously, too, um, you know. Performing marriages, uh, you know, that's that's a great part of what we're allowed to do. Not all judges do them, but I, I do, and I, I believe Judge Miller and, and Cooper do as well. So I've, you know, I've, I've probably done about 30 or so weddings in my tenure. So that's another nice part about what we do. That's awesome. Um, now I'll go back to Judge Cooper and I'll ask, what's your least favorite part of being an MTJ? Child's court. Um, when I have to do the preliminary hearings for child's court, it's very difficult um, for me. One of my very first hearings in child's court was a student that I had taught. And, I, you know, I was always wondering, was one of more my, my, my uh, very on top of it, you know, always was on top of it. But to see what she was actually going through was very troubling. And then you see that on a consistent basis. And just because I just got a heart for children because I've been, you know, I taught elementary education for so long. Um, you know, child's court is by far my least favorite aspect of the job, but it has to be done and um, everything ended up works, working itself out. But some of those preliminary hearings are, are real rough. 
Judge Miller, what's your least favorite part? Uh, a couple different things. Anytime when you have a young child as a victim in certain things, that's always tough, uh, you know, because, you, you know, especially if you have kids or grandchildren, things like that. And, you know, it's hard anytime you have a child as a victim. Also, um, the three of us volunteered to serve uh, down in homicide court to hear preliminary hearings on homicide. And when I go down there and, you know, 90, probably 95% of the time, the defendants in the case are all young young men or women, you know, they're probably between 19 and 22, 23 years old. And you're thinking they're looking at spending the rest of their life incarcerated, you know, and that just bothers me, uh, you know, because, you know, we hear all the time now about the gun violence uh, and, you know, the, the, you know, issues with drugs, you know, or, you know, fentanyl and, uh, you know, that takes a toll on our community. Okay, I'm going to switch to something a little bit more positive. Judge Martini, what is something you have learned about your community through your time as an MDJ? Um, that I didn't already know. Uh, just, I mean, really just how, how busy it is regarding, you know, landlord-tenant cases and um, building code property maintenance. You know, I mean, I knew we certainly had a need for some of the property maintenance cases, you know, and just trying to clean up, which I mean, I try to, I'm a big advocate for trying to clean up some of the neighborhoods. I mean, but there's just a, and you know, it's something else that I learned over the course of two years, how many of these cases that are filed by the city of Pittsburgh, where the owner is the owner or owners are deceased. So it's, it's really a dead end that we, we just, you know, the courts haven't caught up with anything that we can do to, try to, you know, do something with this property because the owners are deceased and it's just, it's just sitting. I mean, but, um, so that, that's something definitely that I didn't know per se going in, but there is a lot of that. I wouldn't have fought it in today's housing market, but there's, there's a fair bit of that. And, um, you know, aside, but it's the least way I wanted to say my least favorite thing too. About okay, go ahead. Uh, but it was just that I, I'm not obviously, yeah, child support is tough in any case involving kids, but Judge Cooper and I also preside over domestic violence court, which are criminal cases that, but they're specialized because they're domestic violence related at Pittsburgh Municipal Court. And that is, those, those a lot of those cases are tough. I mean, you, you see, you see victims, you know, there some, a lot of times they're repeat, you know, victims in cases and it, it, it's just tough. I mean, and there's just, those, those dockets are jammed every week. You know, there's just, it's tough to hear these cases just about some things that people go through from, you know, someone that they live with or a loved one, a parent, the spouse, a significant other. I mean, it's, it takes a toll. It's definitely tough. Thank you for that. Um, Judge Cooper, what's something you've learned about your community through your time? The, uh, because I'm getting so many permits, license and inspection, I kind of have to uh, piggyback off of what Judge Martini said. It's, there's a lot of houses in my area that are just deplorable and, you know, the city is fouling against these particular owners, but you run into these dead ends because the owners are deceased, you know? So now the, the, the county has to go above and beyond and find who the next of kin is, you know, and, and, and that, that process just doesn't happen. So you just look at certain communities that are just so deplorable with these homes. And then on the other hand, sometimes the amount it takes for people to actually get the permits and things to fix these homes up, the process is, you know, it, it takes a, a, a while and it's a lot of different moving parts to get the permits that are actually getting the work done and it's expensive, you know, and I just didn't know that when someone buys a, a home and, you know, they're trying to get into the real estate business or, they inherited a home, but, the, you know, it needs so much work to it. Um, the permits and the things that you have to go through to actually to get the home done is very extensive and is very time consuming. And it can be very frustrating for someone that's new to that process. And I just didn't know that the um, landlords and make a home look nice. Thank you for that. Judge Miller, what have you learned about your community through your time? 
You, you learn a lot and you know your community, as Judge Martini said, you know your community because you know, you're from here. But yeah, you realize when, how appreciative people are sometimes, uh, even though you might have wrote against them if they, fear that they, if they feel they got a fair and impartial hearing. Um, yeah, I mentioned about doing the things in schools and you're really appreciative of that when you, you know, you're going through the grocery store and a, yeah, a child comes up and says, oh, hi, Judge Miller, how are you? And yeah, it refers to the Goldilocks thing. And um, yeah, and you know, if you help people out, how appreciative they are. Uh, a young, well, he's not a young man, but he had some driver's license issues and we kind of helped him out in getting his license straightened out. He got his license back. And he eventually got hired uh, working on a street crew in another municipality. And anytime I see him now, he comes up and shakes my hands and thanks me, you know, for being one compassionate with him and helping him get things straight. So with just a few minutes left, I'd like to give you three judges just a little bit of time if there's anything you think we didn't address that you'd like to talk about. Judge Martini, would you like to go first? Do you have anything? Um, I, it seems like we covered, you know, the pretty much the nuts and bolts of what all of the, all district judges, you know, kind of do on a weekly and daily basis. Um, the only I, The only thing I maybe would add would be um, we do have the authority as a district as a district judge to issue emergency protections from abuse orders. So primarily those are handled through Pittsburgh Municipal Court during the arraignment shift. But anyone can also come to any of our district offices during normal business hours, which are, to, you know, eight to four, eight thirty to four thirty. But I mean, so that's something that we also do. And that emergency protection from abuse order, if issued and granted, is is good until the next business day that the Court of Common Pleas Family Division is open. So if you're seeking an emergency protection abuse order on Friday night at 6 p.m. and the judge working grants that order, it is good until Monday for as long as it's not a holiday. So but if you say say you come in and, you know, get one on a Wednesday night, it's only good until close of business Thursday. So if you don't go to Common Pleas Family Division, that order expires on Thursday. Uh, we, we can do the um, emergency protection abuse orders, which would be protection from a um, partner, um, a um, relative, or you could also get one on behalf of a minor child. Yeah. And just to uh, piggyback on what Judge Martini said there, um, and we mentioned that earlier in the program, uh, we staff uh, Pittsburgh Arraignment Court 24-7, 365 days a year, there is a judge on duty in Allegheny County. Um, and if you need a PFA, that you can come down there and apply for a protection from abuse order. Uh, you know, so, you know, every day, yeah, if you need something or somebody, the police need a search warrant, the police need an arrest warrant, um, somebody needs arraigned on charges, there is somebody there. Uh, if you go down, yeah, Thanksgiving's coming up. Thanksgiving Day, you know, there's going to be a judge down there working. Uh, I got a couple, few things that I, I would like to share. One, one interesting fact that y'all might not know is uh, we don't actually get vacation days. So what we have to do is we have relationships with our colleagues. And if Judge Miller is, you know, taking a vacation to Florida, he has to adjust his schedule or he has to have someone sit for him. Um, so that's something that a lot of people don't know. So we have to be very particular about how we, um, we schedule our hearings and everything at our particular office. And even when we're on, when we're downtown. So, you know, there are um, serious matters where they will get, will get coverage from senior judges. Like if you um, are very sick or something like that, or if you got to go to school, when we do go to continuing ed school, uh, we'll get a senior judge. But other than that, we have to find our own coverage for vacation days. So it's not difficult because everyone is just so helpful, you know. Um, so I, that's just something that I wanted to share. And also um, just the component of becoming a judge, having to, you know, pass the class. And, and, and there's so some people that are so book smart and they'll, you know, they'll pass the class. But then the second part to it, is the politics part. The hard part about being an MDJ is 
once every six years, you got to get into the p political arena and get elected again. And then you got to turn it back off because judges can't be affiliated with politics. So, you know, you get into this zone where you're always at these different events and everything and you're fundraising and you're getting in the community and then you win and you got to turn everything off in like one day. I mean, you have to shut it down. So that, that's just something else that's kind of interesting about being a, a magistrate, a, a MDJ, where it's common plea and other judges, it's a one time thing. Whereas we once every six years have to be elected by the people. Thank you for that. And then I think we have a final question from Nancy. It seems like your hand is up. You're on mute. Part of my question was whether they were elected or not, but she partially um, answered. Um, how often do they run on a post or is it a big contest? I think it, it varies so from, I, I, you know, office to office. I mean, I there when I originally ran, um, there were four of us that were running. You know, and then I've been very blessed that for, uh, for each time that I've ran since then, I've been unopposed. Um, yeah, but we run every six years. It's a six year term and it's th the same year as municipal elections. So this year is an election year for judges. Yeah, I'm only in, I'm in my second term and I ran um, unopposed as well, my second term. But something that Judge Miller said and Judge Mar um, Judge Martini said, the community knows if, if you're around. They know if you care about them. They know if you ran on the platform when they voted for you the first time. If you did everything that you said you were going to do the first time, they're going to vote for you again. And, you know, there's no point of running against a, a, against the incumbent if they did everything that they said they were going to do, because the community appreciates that. So, um, you know, I tip my hat off to Judge Miller. You heard all of his stories and, you know, running against him would be a waste of money. <laughs> well, this is my last term. So, you know, it's, you know. I had, I'm, I'm, I'm in my first term and I had, I had one opponent when I, when I ran two years ago. Well, I wanted to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, thank you, Judge Martini, Judge Miller, and Judge Cooper. We really, really appreciate you coming out tonight. Um, I think everyone here found this program really insightful and helpful. Um, like they all said, 2023 is a judicial election year. Um, and I want to encourage everyone here to learn about the candidates and get out and vote. Uh, Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts is actually having a judicial candidate forum on October 24th. Um, so anyone who would like to register can be a part of it and learn about the candidates. You can register at www.pmconline.org. Um, and yeah, I wanted to thank everyone again for coming and the judges, I can't thank you enough. And thank you for being the moderator. Thank you. Everyone have a great yes, rest of your night. Thank you. Everybody have a, have a good night. Yes. All right. Have a good night. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.